Hi, everyone. It's Emil. It's Emil Guillermo. Uh, Emil Amuktio coming at you straight up 2 o'clock Pacific here on what we call the Emil Amux Takeout. We're live. It says 115T, but oh, God, see now, it's just that my keyboard was acting up today. I meant to say show 156, not 15t of course what what is 15t it's it's show 156 oh it's 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 insane. <laughs> okay look i'm gonna get this right because you know we, we we run a a semi-tight ship here and and people will be looking for show 50 156 and they'll say did he mean show 15t no he didn't mean show 15t he meant Emil Amux take out live from his gong closet. Number 156. Yeah. W D A A A T. What does an Asian American think? We fill the void because, you know, they never ask. They never ask. Except, you know, when they target us, there are some pollsters who target Asians. And they make sure it's in language and they make sure they, they talk to enough Asians. There's enough of a sampling. Those are the good polls. This isn't a poll. We just, I just tell you, this is what an Asian American thinks. Okay. It's me. It's just, am I that average? Am I just like every other? I'm not like every other Asian, but mostly because I speak out. Anyway, welcome to the program. I'm Emil Guillermo, Emil Muck, right? Emil at amok.com. If you want to, email some people like to email you can if you're on chat if you're finding us on facebook the chat should be turned on at emil guillermo.media or wherever you are watching this on facebook uh and so put in the chat if, if you have something to say uh i i think we're also streaming on emil amok e-m-i-l-a-m-o-k at uh on twitter right at emil amok so all these different ways, we, we come here live because we, we just feel the energy of live, right? When you're live, you're live. It's dangerous. You can make a mistake and then you can just quickly correct it. You understand that there's no guilt when you make a mistake. You just correct it and move on. It's not a matter of shame where... You make a mistake and it's not correctable because you are the mistake. I mean, that, that tends to happen a lot with Asian Americans and minorities. We're not the mistake. In fact, we count. We fill the void. I talk about the issues as if we matter and welcome to the program. The Lanya part will be all. All of this. Usually I like to get out after after 15 minutes. Now, those of you who listen or watch this program know, what is he thinking 15? He's never gotten out of here less than 40 minutes. What do you, the whole thing is a lanyap. That little something extra just for you. Today on the program, I, I want to address Lisa Ling. Yeah, Lisa Ling is really... You know, I like her. I, I really like Lisa Ling. She does an, a, a great show. This is life. She did something on Vincent Chin. I'm going to talk about it. Uh, I'm going to talk about my ALDEF column on aaldef.org slash blog, which I put out today, which is, now I'm not going to say it's the reason why I didn't come on at 145. No. I was doing some other things. But I'm going to talk about that ALDEF column. You can, If you want to read along with me, you can go to aldef.org slash blog and see my latest. It also ends up talking about Filipino history. And, of course, you've got to talk about the Giants. In fact, I'm going to get the Giants out of my, my system now because, my God, what a game they played last night. If you're on the West Coast and you're a Dodger fan, okay, that's great. I'm on the West Coast. I'm a Giant fan. This is the greatest thing for Asian-American baseball fans. Uh, really, uh, 
uh, you know, not since the last Dodger Giant series. I, you know, I'm telling you, if you're an Asian American baseball fan, it's a great time because the Giants and Dodgers play each other more than any other team because they're in the same division. And the Giants have won one more game, right, throughout the season, the regular season. And now here they are in this divisional matchup. It should mean more, some people say. But it it is what it is. They've got to face the winners gotta go on and face the the Eastern Division for the NLCS, the championship series, and then go on to the World Series, who whoever it is. So the Giants and Dodgers played a classic game last night in Chavez Ravine in Los Angeles, except it felt like San Francisco, the way the wind was blowing. And where I am, I am about 500 miles north, right? And I swear, if I wasn't nailed down to my seat, I would have blown down into Los Angeles. That's how windy it was all throughout the state. The wind was real. And you saw what happened in the very last out. The wind essentially was the act of God that said, no, 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 Dodgers. No, the Giants are going to win this one. And the ball was knocked down. <laughs> was essentially prevented by the wind. And the Giants cut the ball, the third out, ninth inning. But that wasn't the only thing, because the Giants had to play in the same situation, the same environment. And in fact, a couple of balls that the Giants hit were held up by the wind and would have gone further, if not out. And thank goodness, there was one run that, that stood up, the home run by Evan Longoria. I guess he's the male desperate housewife, Evan Longoria. But for Evan Longoria fans who've been waiting for him to bust out and have a great, just the kind of year that he's always promised or that his stature promised when the Giants got him because he's been hurt, he's been up and down. That was a great home run. The Giants fans will remember, and Dodger fans too. It stood up, and the Dodgers were up against, or rather the Giants were up against, essentially the best pitcher in baseball. And for being doubted all this time, the Giants, even with the best record in baseball, they, they look like crap on paper. They look like they're not going to be great. They pulled it out. And in the end, it was the win, but also a 23-year-old pitcher named Camilo Duvall who throws 100, 100 mile per hour fastballs and sliders. What a great performance by that young kid. So I'm looking forward to the game tonight. And I hope the Giants close it out because they got the Dodgers exactly where they want them at home. If you're a Northern Californian, Asian American, you're excited. And look, if you're a Southern Californian, Asian American rooting for the Dodgers, it's going to be a good game. Good game. And I think maybe, maybe the winner would have to be seen as the favorite to go on to the World Series. All right. Uh, let me talk about uh, Lisa Ling. You know, I, I, I admire her work. Uh, she's been doing This Is Life for some time and on CNN. And, you know, they don't push it enough. They don't promote This Is Life enough. And they should have because this time around it was on Vincent Chin. And I, I really, I've been writing about Vincent Chin for a long time. And I say this, if you are younger and don't know you know, haven't really gotten into the Vincent Chin story and need a one shot to, to like catch up and understand what Vincent Chin's about. This is as good a thing that you can watch and then pass on to your friends because it tells a story with some significant differences from other things. And I'll get into that because I've been writing about Vincent Chin for as long as I can remember. In fact, one of the great things about 
what Lisa Ling did is that she chose Helen Zia, the author, journalist, also the uh, trustee of the Chin Estate. And I guess I should have known this for as long as I've talked to Helen, for as long as I, I've known Helen, Helen Zia, but I didn't realize that she worked in the auto industry and that she helps you helped in the assembly line putting together cars I, I didn't realize that Helen had worked in Detroit in that capacity and yesterday was the first time I really got the sense of how the auto industry was impacted by Japan and by the Japanese car makers and how that impacted people's lives in Detroit. Now, in the past, being in California, look, I know how the auto industry was impacted and how important it was that they stand up to Japan. But as I did my stories on Vincent Chin, it was at most a paragraph. It never really sufficiently set up the context for what happened to Vincent Chin. And I really think for the first time, Lisa Ling in interviewing and using Helen Zia as a way into the story, it, it sunk in, it got, I understood for the first time deeply because they showed film clips about how people were reacting, how desperate things became in Detroit. If you were a middle-class auto worker making a good living had a house on the lake had a recreational vehicle or a boat suddenly to have your whole world your whole economic world turned upside down that was a big deal and people began to see the japanese well the japanese auto industry hence the japanese they made that connection. They began to see the Japanese as the enemy. And that point came out clearly last night. More clear than the times I've told the story. I've often just sort of brushed through and said, oh, yeah, there was some xenophobia. But here's the thing. Vincent Chin was Chinese, not Japanese. It was kind of irrational what the perp did, but it was all irrational, right? To the to scapegoat his economic misfortune, the the perp who murdered Vincent Chin, to blame it on on the Asian auto industry, although he saw it as justified, and then to blame all Asians or to see all Asians as the same. I'm talking about the man who murdered Vincent Chin, Ronald Liebens. So this was really the first time that I saw how easily what was happening economically in Detroit fueled the animus that erupted in the Chin case. And it hit me. It hit me how, especially when I saw Ebens on a clip say, that he fully expected jail time for beating Chin to death, which is a fact that I don't think I, I clearly understood. I, I never heard him say that in particular. But the fact that he didn't serve jail time just adds to the travesty of the case. Where Ronald Liebens, the man who murdered Chin, spent no time in jail. So when the things I liked about the telling was that, you know, the, the bringing out the context of the economic situation to, in Detroit, where people were, were destitute. They were having a hard time because of this trade war, right, between Japan. And then there were some things that, Helen Zia shared with me in 2017 that are not widely known, 
but it's how the ACLU, the National Lawyers Guild, and others balked at supporting the Asian Americans effort, efforts to seek justice. Once they did not get justice on the local level, they wanted to go to the federal level and make a civil rights case. And as Helen Zia said, people were astonished that Asian Americans were making that claim because Vincent Chin is not black. And then I saw a clip also to the credit of Lisa Ling and her producers that showed support for Zia's advocacy group, the American Citizens for Justice, support from none other than the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who can be seen saying, we must redefine America so everyone fits in the rainbow somewhere. And to me, seeing that just kind of brought it back from the past to the present and even to the future. Because you see the importance of coalitions, of working together. Especially when Asian Americans are still just, what, 6% of the, of the nation? 23 million at best when you include all the mixed race folks? We need each other to work together. And to see Helen Zia say, when she saw Jesse Jackson supporting the cause for Vincent Chin, she said every religion and walk of life came together. Black, white, Latinx, LGBTQ, Jewish, Muslim, saying we are with you. We stand with you. And that really was the beginning of the Asian American movement in America when people realized we were part of this civil rights movement. Well, the advocates for Chin initially felt that. They were blocked. But when people came together and recognized us, that was a big deal. And when was that? 1982, 1983. So there are other aspects of this This Is Life with Lisa Ling episode. She even goes to Oakland and once again shows the coalition, Compassion for Oakland, a group that goes around helping seniors in the Oakland Chinatown. And she talks to an African-American, a young African-American in his 20s, saying, I grew up in this neighborhood. You know, I, I feel bad that this is happening. So it's a, it was a, it's a good piece. And I, I really recommend that you see the rerun because they'll be rerunning it often on, uh, on CNN. Track it down. The Lisa Ling, this is life with Lisa Ling and Vincent Chin. Helen Z is there and really is as eloquent as I've seen her in breaking down and telling the Vincent Chin story. Now, it's great. So here's the but. And it's a gentle but. But it's a but. And, and that is when they go into how Vincent Chin is is essentially symbolic of, you know, anti-Asian hate. And they go back to the, they go back to the Exclusion Act of 1882. It's history. But they often give short shrift to the history. Yes, it's important to mention the Exclusion Act, Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And then they jump from 1882 to 1941 to the internment of Japanese Americans as if nothing happened between 1882 and 1941. It just went from exclusion 
to 41 in internment, and that's all you got. And I just think that's a big leap because a lot happened. All the significant Filipino history parts. I mean, they even talk about how if the Asian face is the enemy and they flash images of the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Vietnamese, who, were, who is a bigger enemy than the country that you won and purchased from the Spanish-American War when those people revolted and said, we don't want anything to do with your stinking rotten U.S. country. And they fought and revolted against the United States. The Philippine-American War is one of the most forgotten wars by everyone. And I like to bring it up, especially during Filipino American History Month, because people don't realize this was our entree into America, Filipinos. We were colonized. We were bought for 20 million from Spain. And then Filipinos revolted, started their own country, revolted, lost. And the Americans colonized the Philippines from 1898 to, or, 1902 to about 1945 or so. In that war, incidentally, a million Filipino civilians lost their lives. That's an estimate. It's a rough estimate because it's a big archipelago, and this is beyond the military, the, the military uh, casualties. This is civilians. You know, who, you know, in the vill the, the the countryside, which was raped and pillaged, the civilians who lost their lives due to disease. So the upshot is the Philippines became a colony, America's first colony, which after they excluded the Chinese in 1882, they were looking at it like, hey, we just got ourselves a new labor force. Indeed, they brought the Filipinos to the United States as colonized American nationals, not quite citizens, 30,000 of them. They brought, they were in California in the 20s and 30s. And that was my father's group. And of course, they were treated just like the Chinese before them. The Chinese that had been excluded from 1882. There were lynchings and violence. And the Filipinos got excluded too. Although maybe it's a little more humane when they say self-deport. But it wasn't that humane. There were a couple images that This Is Life with Lisa Ling did show. They showed a door that said no Filipinos allowed. I mean, if you were it flashes by quickly in the montage. But it makes no sense if you don't know the context. No Filipinos allowed to... Where was that? That was in Stockton, California. California, the 20s and 30s. But you don't get it. If you don't understand the context, you just say, here's a door that says positively no Filipinos allowed. What the heck does that mean? And, and this is why October has been designated by the Filipino American Historical Society as our month for history. Our month to tell our story. All of it. And it's warranted by all the omissions. People are still trained not to see it. And what's glorious about a, an American democracy that has or establishes its first colony, sort of like, you know, I mean, it's just, 
you don't expect that from a democratic nation that it intentionally conquers a people and says you're our colonists oops they're not colonists they're colonized big difference so that that was a an omission in the history part i'm sure look i i've done television i know there are time constraints but see how many times in the telling of history you see the omission of the Filipinos. Especially now when we talk about the exclusion, 1882, and how they automatically just jumped to 1941. The internment. Exclusion, internment. Next thing, 1965, the Immigration Act, and those three things become the mentionables. And there are a lot of other things that happened that were not as famous, but just as hateful. You know, between uh, in the 30s, Filipinos were lynched. There were anti intermarriage laws that said Filipinos could not intermarry. They were, they were colonized, so they couldn't be citizens. They couldn't vote, couldn't own land. They were truly second class in America. That's the Filipino American story. So aside from that little historical thing that you can get from listening to this show, I, I would have hoped that maybe another 20 seconds could have been added in the context of some of the things they did show. Now, you know, the, the, This Is Life with Lisa Ling did show that positively no Filipinos allowed. They also showed the shot of Noel Quintana, 61, when they talked about stop Asian hate. They show Quintana, who's in the subway and got his face ripped apart with a box cutter. Of course, he doesn't get a chance to speak. You just know that he's just lumped in there, one of the Asian Americans. It would have been nice to acknowledge that a lot of us have been entrapped by the China virus slur that was perpetrated by the former president. And we aren't Chinese, but we are. Asian American. So it, it just is, it's good though. I'm glad that Lisa Ling, this is Lisa Ling, is out there in October, Filipino American History Month, because we see how this is an ongoing thing about Filipinos, but we also get the advantage of getting some real a real good piece on Vincent Chin, which lets us know we are not out of the woods in terms of being misunderstood, of being left out. And really the big, the big thing that um, I think, I, I like the hopeful tone of the overall episode because it shows people in Oakland's Chinatown showing care and compassion for each other, which is what we need. It's what we need after this pandemic era where more than 9,000 instances of hate have been recorded by the Stop API hate folks and other groups that are monitoring these instances. So catch it if you can. This is life with Lisa Ling talking about uh, talking about Vincent Chin.
Now, I will say this. I they talk I talked to the producers for a few hours, but mostly talking about the, my the writing I did on the Vincent Chin case because I have been I've been plagued, not plagued. I've been what is the proper word? Vincent Chin has sort of been a fact of my life since my uh, since my 20s in the media. In fact, you know, we were about the same age, Vincent Chin and I. And if you go through my ALDEF columns, you'll know that I, I kid that Vincent Chin and I both had success perms at the... An Asian American with a perm, my goodness. And our names aren't uh, Kim Jong Il and Kim Jong Un. He had the fade. So, I don't know. If I were a friend of Vincent Chin and if I grew up in Detroit, I don't think, I don't think there'd be any question we'd be buddies. Because we looked alike. And if we knew each other, I'd like to think, I would have been in the fancy pants with him. And then I would have known everything that went on. Oh, let me also say, they really focused on that Vincent Chin section of This Is Life with Lisa Ling. They, they focused on Racine Cowley, who was the dancer. Now, a lot of people, I mean, she came out later. She was not, as, as Helen Zia points out, she was not part of the, um, of the investigation at first. And there were other interviews and other, other testimony from friends who were at the Fancy Pants. But it was this one dancer whose testimony really emboldened those who supported the idea that this was race motivated because she heard Sherrod Eben say to Vincent Chin or someone in the part, she heard the conversation or the, the, the phrase that it's because of you guys that we're not working or something to that effect. Which means there was some race motivation. No matter what Ebens may say publicly to people to this day. So check it out. Um, this is life with Lisa Lane. Uh, credit watchers will note that, like I said, uh, they my name flashes by in the credits, and but mostly on what I've written about the, uh, the Chin case, and not. I don't think I to I talked about Filipino history, but uh, Filipino history. Here we are in October. Filipino History, Filipino American History Month. And these little things have come up over the last couple of days. We had Maria Ressa winning the Nobel Peace Prize. Typical Asian American Filipino comes here as a young kid. She's a 1.5, grows up in New Jersey in Tom's River, goes to Princeton, goes back to the Philippines and makes her mark, wins a Pulitzer Prize. Maria Ressa. We've talked about her last couple of shows. But I want to talk also about, and this is one of the focuses of my column, the New Jersey nurse who was killed, Times Square. I mean, I saw that headline and I just reacted. I said, got to be Filipino. I hate it when I'm right. Because then I saw, I was, I went through the news, yeah. Maria Maria Ambrosio, 58, who 
was in Times Square on Friday. A perp had snatched the phone from another woman trying to get away. Didn't see Ambrosio. Knocked her down. She hit her head on the pavement hard. She died at a New York hospital on Saturday. They said mass for her on Sunday. A memorial for her on Monday. The perp, homeless man, 26, charged with second degree murder. Look, it's not a hate crime, but it's along the lines of, well, murder is not a love crime. I, I don't suppose you need a hate crime enhancement for this. But the fact is, the perp just didn't see Ambrosio. Just ran over like she wasn't there. You know, and that, that's no accident. Here's Ambrosio, who spent more than 20 years as an oncology nurse at the Bayonne Medical Center, caring for critically sick people. You'd think she deserved better, right? And I didn't know her, but when I saw her picture, I, I, I could have called her my sister. Or as they say, Ate. She's my Ate. But it's a pattern for Filipino Americans to come here, live their dream, send remittances to the family back home, and then it adds to the pain when it ends so abruptly and someone doesn't notice them. Or maybe they just see us and they don't care. It's the tragic invisibility, not just of Ambrosio, But of all Filipinos and many Asian Americans, people don't care. And that's one of the reasons why I do this. Because I talk about things that we care about. I talk about things as if we matter. That's why I call it the micro talk show of the AAPI and the AAFs, the or the A, Asian Asian American Filipino, but it's the AAXs, right? It's my naming convention for all the different ethnicities. The AAHs, the Hmong, Asian American Hmong. But this uh, is uh, History Month. We have it so we can take the time so we can remember about who we are and why we do what we do here in America. Okay, a few more things I got to mention. I talked about the Hmong. We talk about the AAHs. We talk about Sunni Lee. You know the Hmong. You know they're 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 from the hills of Laos. And it's not that cold up. It's not like you're you're going up to Lake Tahoe or something. I right? it's the hills, but it's. I don't believe they go skiing there. So for the Hmong to relocate. In places like St. Paul and Minnesota and Wisconsin, where it's cold. Oh, my God. But they, they are defining a new Asian America right there in the Midwest. Where it's frigid and cold and where they are staking out their claim. And where people like Suni Lee are doing their thing. And I mentioned this guy yesterday. And I want to mention him again. A shout out to Shen Yu Her who was recognized as the first Asian or first Hmong American male anchor. He does the early, early morning news on um, Du Bois Channel 5. And, wow, 
he got a shout out on CBS this morning. And it, it just, it hit me because when I got my first job in Reno in 1979, and I was doing new sports and weather from the anchor desk from Reno market number 140 something. And I said, I'm going to make it somewhere. And there were no Asian American anchor men, nothing like that. And it was just, well, it was Everest back then and it's still Everest now. But thank goodness. Now we got a among American 30 years later. And you know, it, it, it made me feel good that they were making a big deal about it because I continue to make a big deal about having been the first Asian or the first Filipino American to host at all things considered in 1989. And, you know, it was a big deal. I mean, I made it a big deal because, Hey, uh, we're not just here to clean your, your house or to mow your lawn or cook your food or whatever. I'll tell you the news too. So it's good to see that the Hmong brother, Chen Yu Her, doing his thing in Iowa. Even though, as I said, 2018, I uh, my car broke down. My Japanese car <laughs> broke down in Iowa, and I spent the longest five five days. In my life in Iowa. I got to know Iowa though in five days. It felt like five years, but I, I got to know it. Anyway, good luck to Chen Yu. All right, a few more things. Uh, while, while, while I have you, and I appreciate you being here, uh, now I'll save this for tomorrow because, you know, are, are you into the John Gruden thing? Are you a football a football fan? Uh, I, I'm a I'm a football fan. I had Raiders season tickets a long, long time ago. During one of the Gruden years, and I was always like, fine if he was our guy. But I I wasn't I wasn't quite sure about John, John Gruden is a very nice when he was an announcer, when he's a coach, when he's on the inside. Who knows? Who knows? But now we, I guess we know because of the emails. But, you know, before launching into a whole new thing, let, let's talk about this tomorrow. Because more people will hear about it. You'll hear about what he's saying. I just think that it boils down to one thing with me. And that is, I'm glad the NFL is cracking down on John Gruden. But there's one name that still bothers me about the NFL being self-righteous about John Gruden because what did they do about Colin Kaepernick? I mean, I... I don't think that's over, although the longer, as more time passes, it does become a detriment to uh, bringing back Colin Kaepernick on the field unless he's working out and in tip-top shape. But it just seems that if they condemn Gruden for his hidden racism, I would feel a lot better if they condemned some of the owners for their colluding to blackball Colin Kaepernick. Because some of the topics that Gruden discussed in this email thread that went out to the very clubby execs in his in his email group 
had to do with things that people don't say in in public, in polite company. It's the kind of racist stuff that gets, well, that's hidden. And when you unearth it and you hold people accountable, there's no defense. There's absolutely no defense for what John Gruden wrote. He wrote it. He didn't say it. He wrote them, these thoughts in his emails. And as a private entity, the NFL is fully within its right to do what it's done which is create that foreboding sense where Gruden had to own up to the fact that he did these things and it was just wrong, just wrong. Funny, you don't hear anyone try to defend Gruden because it's indefensible. The stuff he said that were that was racist, homophobic, misogynistic. It's just old boy clubby stuff. Clubby, right? Just us racist here. Wink, wink. Indefensible. And yet, how do you explain Donald Trump? And how the Republicans, instead of rejecting the racist, homophobic, misogynistic, you know, people who back Trump, the January 6th folks, how how do you square that? People just embracing that instead of rejecting and saying, All of that is a threat to our democracy, a bigger threat to our democracy than John Gruden. And maybe this is one way that corporate racist America scapegoats someone. They'll sacrifice John Gruden, but they won't understand that what gave him the green light and the confidence to say whatever he wanted in those emails was because of the environment created from 2016 to the present by Donald Trump. All right, so we'll talk more about this uh, subsequent shows. Hey, look, thank you very much for being here. I'm Emil Guillermo. Emil Amuck, uh, number 156, this is. W-D-A-A-A-T, what does an Asian American think? Now you know. I like to say, be here, bang the gong now. I'm at uh, amok.com. You can email me there, Emil at amok.com. On Facebook, I'm at emilgalermo.media. Like us, do what the algorithm says. Because the algorithm, it's our friend. And look, Facebook is bad. But I'm sort of like the anti-Facebook. I'm the, an- I'm the antidote to all those people who say, oh, I'm not going to get vexed. No, I say get vaccinated. I'm the vaccinate. I'm the plea. I'm the please vaccinate guy. We're here Monday through Friday live, 2 p.m. Pacific. If you missed us, just go on amok.com. Check out uh, my Twitter at Emil Amok. Now we come to that portion of the show. The true lanyap, the true something extra. 
if you've made it this far, pat yourself on the back. Thank you. I know sometimes it's, it's easy to feel a sense of shame and a sense of guilt. Remember, guilt is different from shame. Guilt is correctable. Right? And shame says you're the mistake. There's nothing to correct. And that's why you have to adjust your thinking. It's all correctable. It's all temporary. You'll feel better. You'll do better. We'll help you. We'll support you. I'm Emil Guillermo. Till next time, be safe, be healthy, be happy, and may you live with ease.